Welcome back, nerdlings. This is part two of Microscopes and the Cell. So we left off discussing the cell theory yesterday. So biological diversity and unity. The underlying diversity of life is DNA. Everything that's alive has DNA. That's the universal genetic language. Cells are the basic unit of structure and function and the basic unit of all living organisms. They are also the lowest level of structure capable of performing all of the activities of life. So most everything you think of a whole organism needing to do has to be done at a cellular level as well. So on a cellular level, cells reproduce, they grow and develop, they utilize energy through the process of cellular respiration as well as photosynthesis, they respond to their environment, so if they're placed in a hypertonic or a hypotonic environment, they respond to their environment in different ways. They also maintain homeostasis, just like we do. So the cell characteristics. All cells are surrounded by a plasma membrane, and they also have cytosol. Cytosol is a semi-fluid substance within the membrane. I always like to compare it to blood. We call it cytoplasm, plasma, plasm, kind of like blood. And technically, cytoplasm is actually the cytosol along with all the organelles inside of it. Cells also contain chromosomes, which have genes in the form of DNA. They have ribosomes, which are the sites for protein synthesis, or where proteins are synthesized. And these are tiny little organelles that make the protein using the instructions contained in the genes. And if you remember, starts off in the nucleus, this is in eukaryotic cells, where messenger RNA makes a template of that DNA strand, takes it out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm, and it takes it to a ribosome where the protein starts to be synthesized. So we have two different types of cells. We have prokaryotic cells and we have eukaryotic cells. They have different locations for their chromosomes. Prokaryotic cells lack a true nucleus or nuclear bound membrane. So they have DNA in a region called the nucleoid region and it separates it from the rest of the cell. The eukaryotic cell has chromosomes in the nucleus and the nucleus is contained within the nuclear membrane or nuclear envelope. So again the two cell types are prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Prokaryotic cells are a lot smaller, they're more simple than the eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells have internal membranes that enclose the internal organelles. So if you look right here, we have examples of prokaryotic cells. They have that nucleoid region, they have pili, they have ribosomes, plasma membrane, they also have a cell wall. So what other types of cells have cell walls that you could think of? Right now, you should be thinking of plant cells as well as fungi cells. They have a capsule. So eukaryotic cells, like I got through saying earlier, are much more complex than prokaryotic cells are. So within their cytoplasm are a variety of membrane-bound organelles. They have specialized structures in form and in function. Eukaryotic cells are also generally bigger than their prokaryotic cells. So this would be an example of a eukaryotic cell. We have our nucleus right here. We have ribosomes on the endoplasmic reticulum. We have a Golgi apparatus. We have mitochondria, which are the sites of cellular respiration where ATP is produced. Some cells have flagellum, like sperm cells. We have peroxisomes. We have microvilli, centrosomes. We have microphelians and microtubules, which are the cytoskeleton. So things that are not in animal cells that are in plant cells are chloroplasts, a central vacuole and tonoplast, as well as cell walls and plasma desmata. So this is an example of a plant cell. As you notice, it has a cell wall. The cell wall helps maintain the plant's structure. It helps the plant cells from expanding until they explode or shriveling up too much. So those give them support. Limits to cell size. There's a lower limit and an upper limit. Like I got through saying, prokaryotic cells are much smaller than their eukaryotic cell counterparts. So the lower limit, or smallest cell, again, are prokaryotic, and those are mycoplasmas. They range from one-tenth to one micron, or micrometer. Most bacteria are between one to 10 microns. The upper limit of cells are, of course, eukaryotic cells, 
and they are 10 to 100 microns large. A micron is the same thing as a micrometer, and a micrometer is equal to one one millionth of a meter. A diameter of a human hair is 20 microns, just to give you a reference. So what limits cell size? It's the surface area to volume ratio. As the cell gets bigger, its volume increases much faster than its surface area does. So smaller objects have a greater ratio of surface area to volume, and that's what we want. This allows materials to get into and out of the cell at a much quicker rate. So for example, if I take these two spheres, all right, things are going to diffuse into the smaller one at a faster rate, or get to the center, I should say, quicker than they would in a larger one. Now the rate of diffusion is actually the same. If you recall, we did that lab last year where we took those cubes of auger that were neon pink and we tried to see how long it took the color to go away or diffuse out of that cube. And you notice that they all had the same diffusion rate. They all diffused out maybe one or two millimeters. But the larger cube that you guys had it would have taken a lot longer for all of that to diffuse out than it did for the smaller cube. So again, it's going to take a lot less time for any type of material to diffuse into and out of something that has a large surface area to volume ratio than for something that has a small surface area to volume ratio like this. It's going to take, again, much longer for something to diffuse all the way into the middle of the cell and then diffuse back out. So if you look at this right here, we're talking about all these cubes. We have a really small cube right here, and the surface area to volume ratio is 6 to 1. And that's a really, really good number or ratio. This one right here is a 1 to 1. That's not so good. And this one right here made out of the mini cubes has a very, very bad surface area to volume ratio. All right, so limits to cell size. Metabolic requirements set the upper limit. So in large cell, we cannot move material into and out of the cell fast enough to support life. So like I was saying in the previous slide, if you look back here, this cube right here isn't going to be very good for getting things into and out of the cell. Now this one right here, since it's made out of a lot of smaller subunits, they can communicate with each other and things can diffuse into and out of. That's why the surface area to volume ratio for the larger cube that is made out of all the smaller cubes and the smaller cube has the same surface area to volume ratio because these are actually broken up so materials can diffuse into and out of each cell and they can cross into the next one. Right here if you look in, this cell is much larger than this one so it's going to take a lot longer for different materials to diffuse into and out of this cell than it would for the smaller cell. So we talk about what process is this. So if you remember way back from last year, we have different types of diffusion. We have passive diffusion, we have facilitated diffusion, and then we have active transport. We also have the passive movement of water, which is called osmosis, and we'll talk a lot about that later. So how do we get bigger? We become multicellular, or the cells divide. This allows the different types of substrates or components or any type of salt or any type of electrolyte that needs to get passed into and out of the cell. If we have lots of smaller cells, that allows for all of these little subcomponents to be passed into and out. But what challenges do you have to solve now? So, we have to figure out a way to exchange all of these materials, and that's the job of the plasma membrane. It functions as a selective barrier. So if you remember, the plasma membrane has a property called selective permeability, meaning that it lets some things in, but not all things in. So it lets some things into and out of the cell. It is selective in what it lets into and out of the cell. It allows the passage of nutrients, of oxygen, and of wastes. It is also composed of a phospholipid bilayer, and lipids are fats, so that is one of the most important
important things that lipids make up is all of our plasma membranes. We have our hydrophilic region right here, or the heads. Hydrophilic, hydro means water, and philic means to like. So these are the water-loving regions. We also have a hydrophobic region right here, which means water-fearing. So organelles and internal membranes. The eukaryotic cell has internal membranes. They partition the cell into compartments, and it creates different local environments. The compartmentalized functions. The membranes for different compartments are specialized for their function, and they have different structures for the specific functions, and they have unique combinations of lipids and proteins that compose those compartments. So, stay tuned for an in-depth look at all the cell organelles 